Okay, thank you again. Okay, next speaker is Mihailo Antovic. He's from the University of Nis in Serbia, associate professor there, head of the Cognitive Science Center. He's been a researcher with a Fulbright scholarship at the University of Fribourg in Germany, and his interest is in music and language cognition. Whenever you're ready, you have the floor. Turn on the floor. Which one is it? Yeah. You hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. It's great to be here in Bologna. Uh, I would like to talk about the relationship between music called creativity, or more elements of music theory, perhaps a little bit music semiotics, and the conceptual blending theory, which is a prominent, I hope, because I supported theory in the cognitive sciences. It started off as a cognitive linguistic theory in the late 1990s, early 2000, 2002, but slowly, gradually, it became a general theory of cognition, which is very, very interested in the notion of creativity, okay? So I talk about musical creativity in light of conceptual blending theory, more particularly on examples of metrical, melodic, and semiotic musical structure. I want to show, number one, how elements of a music theory conceptually emerge by blending or putting together distinct conceptual elements from music itself and the world of experience. So you get a blended construct. And then how these emergent results of previous blending operations are used as inputs for further conceptual interaction. And I would also like to uh, speculate on some possible constraints on this creative, somewhat recursive blending process in music. Okay? But in order to give you the details, I first have to tell you a bit about the conceptual blending theory. So uh, it's best if one starts with an example. Okay, so this is me discussing things with Kant. Okay, you can see that I'm pretty bewildered because Kant is definitely much, much brighter than I am. Uh, so he, the theory started off as an explanation of strange linguistic expressions, counterfactuals, metaphorical expressions, uh, deliberate puns used in newspaper commercials, and so on and so forth. So I've been debating this problem with Kant all night is a classical example of of, of, of how the theory tries to, to approach counterfactuals. So one possible explanation of how our mind is able to understand, I hope you all do understand this, 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 this sentence, would be something like this. Okay, so there might be two distinct conceptual packets involved, which the theorists call mental spaces, okay? So in one mental space, we would have me here in Bologna in the 21st century, hopefully still alive, talking or reading a book by Kant and struggling with a question of morality. And in the other mental space, you would have Kant in 18th century in Königsberg, Germany, back then Germany, okay, perhaps writing one of his critiques, right? And then when we put some of the elements of the two conceptual spaces together, now there are many, many, many rules as to what can be combined, what cannot be combined. I cannot go into all details now. But when we put them together, what emerges from the interaction is what they call a blended mental space, okay? Some sort of an image of me and Kant discussing the problem whatever, related to morality or whatever. Okay, so this is how it all started, puns, metaphors, and so on and so forth. But after a while, it turned out that this kind of method could come in very handy for discussing all kinds of uh, cognitive processes and all kinds of issues related to creativity. For example, this would be, where is it? Yeah, here it is. This would be a proverbial example, right? The Sphinx, so what is it? It has, uh, one mental space would deal with, with, with human beings, right, with a, with a person, and the other would, do, would, would have to do with the, 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 the lion, and then you put these two together and get a, 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 a new mythological creature. So mythology, religion, they're packed with examples like this one. Uh, very importantly, new elements emerge in the blend. So you have something novel, something which was not there in the inputs, and it comes from the interaction itself. You have this in the sciences, for example, social sciences, now the tip of the iceberg metaphor that you have with Freud, right? So consciousness is the tip of the iceberg, you have the tip of the iceberg or the iceberg, and you have the human mind, you put them together, and now something emerges, like the idea that we could have more superficial and more deep layers in our consciousness, okay? I will not try to explain what space-time is because I have no idea, I'm a social science guy. But they tell me, physicists tell me that space-time, for example, could be considered a typical blending construct, okay? So, this has been applied to numerous aspects of cognition, okay? Uh, in music, some folks have done this before me, probably much better than I do, okay? But conceptual blending theory may be applied to some tenets of music theory. So let's see how it works in terms of structure. I'm particularly interested in melody and rhythm, here, pitch hierarchies and rhythm. And in terms of semiotics, something what some people call the meaning of music. So remember, we want three phenomena. First, simpler blends that in turn serve as inputs to more complex blends which results in new creative emergent properties of the system. So we start with the simplest thing in any music theory, which is two pitches. 
Okay? My throat is in a terrible condition, but you can imagine that I, that I sing two tones of different heights. Forgive my use of the term heights, because that's not what we actually have when you hear the tones, okay? Ba, ba, ba. That was terrible, but okay, you get the idea. Okay, so, uh, so what are these two like? And of course you will say, well, they are low and high, right? Of course they are low and high. Is it really of course that they are low and high? Is, it any, is there anything in the music itself, in the, in the, in the thing that I'm producing, that, that, it, that actually makes them low and high? No, it's a matter of our conceptualization. So the two tones are produced in my mouth, they might be heard in the, in the speakers, hopefully. They're actually interpreted by our minds, but they are not inherently low and high. By the way, this is cultural, culturally Latin. Other cultures can use different conceptualizations. So in order to interpret even this basic, construct even this basic construct of music theory, what we need to do is have a referential space. That is to say, something from the extra musical world, let's say small and big persons or low and high objects or entities, and then we put together these two things in order to get the full-fledged musical construct, okay? Now, more technically, an analysis would, would be something like this. So we have tones with their frequencies, in whatever way interpreted or, or perceived as different by our minds, and there are, again, theories and theories about this, how this happens. We have low and high objects, and then we have two elements which we put together according, some, according to some connections, and we end up with a metaphor that pitches our heights. This is a metaphor. This is not really something inherent to the music. So. Here we have emergence. Now there is a distance between the two tones which we didn't have in the inputs. So the distance between these two tones is an emergent structure. This is already creative in some sense, in some very basic sense. And then we can use this emergent structure in order to create more complex structures, such as the idea of musical scales. Again, I'm singing terribly, okay? Da 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 da. The worst major scale that you ever heard, okay? So, uh, yeah. So, we have, we have eight separate distances here, right. Now, in different cultures, this is again conceptualized differently. Of course, in English, we would say that this is a scale. In my language, which is Serbian, Serbo-Croatian, we would say the ladder. But I guess you get the, the idea that these two images are pretty, pretty similar, right? So we relate this to something from the extra linguistic reality. And then again, lo and behold, we get the musical construct, okay? Again, more schematically, we have something like this. This would be a conceptual blending analysis. And you get a metaphor, the pitch sequencing is vertical movement. Watch movement. Now the distances are made more discrete and the path topology emerges from the blend, resulting in our sense that the music is moving. Music is not moving anywhere, okay? Again, it's produced in the resonator, interpreted in the mind, but we keep talking about musical movements, motion, and so on and so forth, okay? So something like this, now it is moving. And then it goes on and on. So this is the basic, the basic example related to melodical structure. And now some more clapping, something related to rhythm. Rhythm can be interpreted in a myriad of ways, and there are, again, hundreds of theories of rhythm. The way to approach rhythm, a possible way to approach it by means of the conceptual blending theory would be this. Okay, so you have isochronous beats. Ba, 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 until we all die, I can go on doing this, right? But we also have something else. We have perceptual salience, which can be created in a myriad of ways. One of the beats can be louder. Ba, 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 longer. Ba, ba. Differently articulated, -da -da -dum -dum -dum. higher, ba, 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 whatever, okay? So when we combine these two things together, what we get is, do I have it? The sense of metrical structure. What emerges from this is cyclicity, or cyclicity, whatever you say, right? So we have an idea that this is cyclic, a cyc cycle that repeats. It's not the same, even when I try to sing it the same way, like it's never totally the same. Not to mention when you have the harmony and the melody and the lead voices and the guitars and whatever, and you're still able to infer it, okay? So it's a blended construct. Now, this blended construct goes on to create more complex blended constructs, like duplets and triplets put together, create something that's very popular in my part of the world, which is the Balkans. That's the complex meter, something like this. And look at my shoulders. Now, people from my part of the world would, would, would respond to this immediately by, by jumping or wanting to dance or something. So perhaps this urge to dance is an emergent psychological property of the further complexity of the rhythmical structure. And you can go on, okay? Two variants of irregular pulse, you put them together, of course you get a more... Uh, you get more of a formal complexity of the meter, but you also get even more of an urge to dance. Listen to this one. This is a traditional song from the south of Serbia. <laughs> And now the other. 
and so on and so forth. Now, whoever can repeat this, that would be very nice. Especially people from the Western world, usually they say that they would have a bit of a problem with this because they don't have this in their musical intuitions. I'm not sure, okay? There are even more complex examples. Okay, and now comes blending in semiotics. So I give you three examples, melody, rhythm, and semiotics, musical meaning. Programmatic music, opera, film music. We put together music with something that is not musical, that's referential, okay? This is my favorite character. You can imagine Darth Vader. Okay, and Darth Vader is usually associated with, you know Star Wars, probably most people here do. All people. Here's the theme, you know the theme. Imperial March by John Williams. You'll hear it. Because I don't want to prompt you to interpret it. Yeah, okay, so you know, so, so you put the theme together with some extra musical context and you, some psychologists would say that this is just behavioral association, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I think that there are elements that emerge from this process, Be, at least that Vader is more frightening after you hear the music, at least that. But the thing is, what happens when the, te when the theme takes off? Again, this blend becomes an input to further blends, look at this, just visual examples for starters. The Vader cartoon, Vader cat, Vader cookies, Vader ladies. And Vader politicians, okay? Now, these are all conceptual blends, and you're laughing, I'm glad that you are, because that's, that's the whole point. We create a new, emergent, novel, creative effect, right? Now, we can do the same thing with the music. So, if we retain the music and change the context, or if we retain the context and change the music, you get all kinds of effects. Ideological messages of different kinds, or irony of different kinds. So, here's Hitler. Is Hitler moving? No, he's not. Hitler move. Okay, he's moving. Okay, maybe a little bit. So I play the theme to, to Hitler movie. Something has changed, right? Okay. And this has been used and abused and abused and abused in a million contexts. I come from Serbia, which was unfortunately bombed in 1999, never again. Uh, the national television played a propaganda video against NATO. You know, NATO planes and you have this music, right? So, okay. But you can also do the other thing, forget about Hitler now, you can change the music and retain Vader. Now my students, when they hear this, this is culturally Latin, the class is over when they hear this. <laughs> so this is the effect that I wanted to have, this play on the accordion, which is kind of very typical of the part of the world that I come from. Yeah. Okay, you got it. You got it. So actually the analysis would look something like this. It's very complicated, but what you have here is the Darth Vader musical space with all its elements. And here it would have something like the Balkan traditional music space. And then some of the elements that map onto one another do not match, okay? So you get a discrepancy here which results in the disruption of your expectancies. And what emerges from the system is that you laugh or that you sense that there is an irony involved or something that really doesn't work, okay? A possible visual equivalent would be this the Darth Vader housewife, right? So we have the Darth Vader space and the housewife space, and then we put them together. And we get something which is funny, maybe not high culture, but it's creative in a sense, I guess. Okay, now, to take home, elements of a music theory may emerge, such as distance, such as musical motion, such as the urge to dance, such as ideological use or abuse in musical semiotics, such as irony or satire, probably many more. So, emergence is an important phenomenon in the cognitive sciences of music, but it has its limits. It's grounded in various levels, which can be biological, cognitive, cultural, linguistic, individual, and so on and so forth. So, we should think, when we talk about emergence as being very important for creativity, formal elements put together, they give us something new out of the blue, in and of themselves. That's okay, that's fine, but we should always also think about the, the constraints on this process. So here, you probably won't hear this because it's too silent. This is an Arabic scale. Do we have somebody from the Middle East? You cannot hear this again. For me, this is a problem. So it's smaller than quarter tones, the distances. I'm not sure I will be able to repeat this one, okay? So there are some discrimination limitations related to my culture or related to my whatever, physiological system, so that there is, there, there, there is a problem with interpreting this scale. Or, who can clap to this one? This is Karl Orff, by the way, Carmina Burana, so he's Western.
Ooh, who can repeat this one? Okay, so you have limit limitations which are psychological, such as short-term memory limit limitations, which which prevent some blends from from working. And of course, you have limitations on variation in the music. Let's get back to Darth Vader for one last time. So, if you don't know anything about Star Wars, I mean, you wouldn't get the blend. You wouldn't get the interpretation in the in the first place. But even if you did know something about Star Wars and bent this theme musically to the point of unrecognizability, you might get, get something like this. This is the last one. This is called the Darth Vader Lament. Can you even recognize it, right? So, again, we have limitations. Okay. It's actually cute. I love it. But I'm not sure John Williams will agree. Here it is, okay? Right, so can we ground blending somehow? So these networks with circles would be things that emerge and these squares or rectangles would be genetic, embodied, perceptual, social, cultural, and so on, uh, uh, grounds as Larry Bar Barcelo calls them, or perhaps anchors, somebody mentioned Ed Hutchins. So somewhere between emergence and, and constraints is where we should look, I think, for musical creativity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very lively presentation. Any questions from the floor or comments? Yes, please. Alva? I would like to ask how you, how you use these marvelous ideas in order to enhance creativity in children's education or teachers' education? Well, how do you get this further? I haven't talked much about it. This is actually more of a theory that explains the roots of creativity than a theory that would be applied to, to practical issues related to creativity. But I think you can. I mean, I was, for example, one idea, uh, the Darth Vader theme, which doesn't have to be, but the, the example that's related to Darth Vader, uh, musical and the extra musical. So you get something like, psychologists know what this, these are, Hyder and Seamal animations. When you have something like a square chasing something like a triangle, where you need to, actually there is no meaning, no interpretation, you need to project yourself into the story, right? Now, you can give them to kids and ask them to project themselves into the story to tell you what's going on. And then you play different kinds of music to this, to another group, and you get totally different interpretations. First, this is important for, for purely experimental reasons because it proves that there is something involved with the mixing of the music and the extra musical, but it can be also used in, in, in a classroom setting, I guess, for example. of musicality um, in terms of what could actually constitute as being creative. Do you have the microphone? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I was wondering what you're... Yeah. Yes, yes, you already know the answer. Yeah, um, um, I guess, what, what, so how exactly were you uh, proposing looking at this from an experimental point of view? I think conceptually very, it makes sense. Difficult. It's very difficult but, because, you know, this is more of a metaphorical model. Uh, I mean, it is... Okay, this is what we can do. So this is something... My group has done some things related to this. So one is the one that I've just mentioned, a master students of mine did a study related to these strange animations and the music that she composed herself, which was, it was important to, to, to exclude anything that might have been in, in, in participants' short-term or long-term memory. And she got the results where the, music, where the interpretation changed significantly with the music added. So that's one possibility. The possibility with the rhythmical structure, with the complexization of rhythm, okay? Yeah. Uh, We've tried just a pilot so far, so there are two possibilities. One would be Likert scales like yours, from one to seven, tell us which one of these makes you dance more. And the other is the secret one that you actually record them. And you, you, you actually record their feet and sta they start tapping to the, right. to, to, the, to the rhythm becoming more complex. So okay. there are ways to do this. And on the pitches and the tones, I've done a lot of that, and I'll, I, I can give you some papers. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker is from the University of Bologna.